one of the main reasons we have this channel is because we get a chance to actually look at things uh, in, in greater depth and, and give more nuance and context to the major things that are happening around the world, especially things that have to do with war and peace or national security, et cetera. And there's a lot of things we call out here and there that are a problem. And, you know, oftentimes we get to the point to where it's like, man, if only we had a, a mouthpiece that was bigger than even just this channel so that we could, you know, talk truth to power where they would actually listen. And, you know, and we talk about ways, send in letters to your representatives, uh, comment on their social media, tag these kinds of reports here onto their media so that it spreads out. A lot of those things that are things we can do. But one of our guests today, the, the favorite of the show, certainly my mom, I've told you before, Matthew Ho actually got a chance to do that in a major way that I'm still in awe of. Uh, Matt, welcome back to the show, first of all, because we're about to show some stuff here. And for anyone who may have missed it, uh, you were on, uh, got to speak before the United Nations Security Council, something hardly anyone gets to do in the world. Uh, and you actually did it just a few days ago. Uh, welcome to the show, man. And, and uh, talk to us a little bit about that uh, process. Well, thanks, Daddy. I appreciate you having me on as always. And, and thank you for, for posting and circulating uh, my briefing uh, to the United Nations Security Council. Um, it was uh, uh, an experience that um, I'm very grateful for, and I have mixed emotions about it, of course, uh, aspects of uh, anger and despondency, but also some, uh, like I said, really very real gratitude. But also I found that as I was speaking to the member states, it was predictable who wasn't listening to me. Um, but what I found was when I went in there, that was my understanding anyway, that I would not be speaking to the Americans. I would not be speaking to the French or the British or to the Russians, uh, but rather to potentially the Chinese and uh, the 10 non-permanent members who might be willing to listen, who might be willing to have someone come in and make an argument for de-escalation in Ukraine. And I should say the briefing was about Ukraine. I'm assuming people have that, you know, understand, have that understanding, but the briefing was about Ukraine. Um, and so to be able to go in there and try and be as impartial as I could be and present my understanding of the conflict and the very real escalatory dangers and to then challenge the United Nations Security Council to do something about that. I also yeah. had the opportunity to speak about uh, the situation in Gaza uh, the genocide in Gaza, and to make clear that the United States was was protecting Israel in its prosecution. Yeah, yeah. Of we're, we're actually going to have a couple of clips of specifically okay. that one as well. But but even before we get into that, I just want to ask, what was it like walking into that room where so much history has been made? And I always remember like Nikita Khrushchev, I believe it was, with his shoe smashing right. it on the table. I mean, so much history about this world uh, especially since World War II, what was it like walking in there and actually sitting down at that at that uh, stair, chair? It was very, uh, I think many people will, 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 will have similar stories of where they've gone into, you know, like this, my entrance into this great temple of diplomacy. And uh, I'm pretty sure the chairs that Khrushchev were sitting in were still being used, you know. So, um, you know, there's that type of banality to it, uh, right, which is so important to understand, though. So important not to idolize or fetish these types of things, but to understand that these institutions are composed of of men and women. Uh, they're, con they're they're constrained by the same type of restrictions, the same type of of burdens, the same type of obstacles that any institution has to encounter. Right. So it was a good thing for me in the sense of of that realization of 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 you know keeping in mind who exactly who I am addressing here and that uh, this is not some type of supernatural lair, uh, you know, but rather yeah. it is a meeting space for the, these disparate nations often aligned in blocks, but still representing their own parochial political interests to meet. And so, uh, I mean, there are some things that were, were you know, uh, you know, in terms of my own personal experience, uh, the meeting had been delayed for the, the Gaza resolution that the United States had put forward on Friday morning that was vetoed by China and Russia. So to see the mechanics of all that, to see how the diplomats mm. interacted with each other or did not interact with each other is incredibly passive aggressive in that room. The diplomats don't even look at each other in the eye, let alone mm. um, 
let alone speak to each other or listen to one another. Um, they're all on their phones the entire time. The only time they're not on their phones is when the camera is looking at them. And that includes their staff people. So people who are familiar with watching clips from the United Nations Security Council and you see the American ambassador and she's sitting there and her people are behind her very stoically and very almost like statues. And as soon as that camera pans away, they're all back up on their phone. Oh, man. I mean, wow. yeah. So, uh, you know, people might be saying, hey, you're extrapolating too much. But the conduct, the behavior there that day didn't lead me to think that it was any different on any other day. And so when you see that type of re those relationships, that body language, you can understand a lot of what's going on there. You know, particularly I'll say just one example, the American ambassador uh, for, for the Gaza resolution, not during mine because she left and Ambassador Woods came in and I could tell another story about him. But uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, the only person she listened to when they were debating the ceasefire resolution uh, for Gaza, the only person that she put her phone down and listened to was the Israeli ambassador. That's it. She would pick her head up occasionally and pay attention to what the British or the French were saying, if it was in sort of in line with what she was saying. But for the most part, she ignored everybody and just looked at her phone the entire time. And that's the American ambassador of the United Nations. And I can't say that many of the other ambassadors were any better. Any different, yeah. During my presentation, Ambassador Woods, who's a deputy ambassador to the United Nations, the United States, he walked out in the middle of my presentation. He got up and walked out. I mean, so that was the. the so he the, knew you were going to speak, though, right? You knew, yeah. I had already been going to oh, speak. So then it was it was planned that he would wait until. And then I don't know if he would movement. exactly. I don't know. I wouldn't put anything past them. I mean, I, the years I was around the State Department, I found that to be the case. That it was the most. In, in looking back, you know, you know. 30 years of professional life I have, right? And by far, the State Department is the most passive aggressive institution I've ever encountered. Wow. And so the fact that uh, <laughs> the ambassador walked out during the middle of my speech was, you know, not surprising to me and, and a bit expected. Uh, still shocking, childlike behavior, yeah. right? But, you know, I don't want to hear you're upsetting me. And, and, and as we'll get into what I said, uh, it's not even as if my speech was completely unbalanced. Yeah, I did criticize the Americans very harshly because I'm an American. And I also think in terms of the Ukraine war, in particular Gaza, the United States has a lot, a lot of, of, of blame on its shoulders. However, I was critical of the United Nations. I was very critical of Russia. Russians, I mean, yeah. right. I mean, so like the idea that I was in there just giving some type of speech, just hammering at the Americans, uh, you know, you're only going to believe that if you've not read the speech or right. if you're just so partisan and you're so defensive that any criticism of you means that the whole yeah. thing is corrupt. Yeah. Right. And, and we're actually going to show some of those very, very clips here in just a second, but I, I will say before we watch this first one here that your 30 years of experience and, and study and development was on clear display because it, from my perspective of watching this, I, I was a little nervous, I'll say, because I was wondering what, what is he going to say, uh, that I, I think you balanced it very well between an actual diplomatic engagement to where you were telling the truth, but you were not railing on anybody uh, or, or unnecessarily condemning anybody with the purpose of exposing things to get something better done uh for the global community, not even just parochially for the United States. But let's look at first one uh, that you thought here, you said here about nuclear weapons, which may have been the most dramatic. In 1991, the same year I graduated high school, the Soviet flag came down at the Kremlin and the Cold War ended. Collectively, we have been given the potential of a world no longer divided into two opposed nuclear armed camps. The reality of that potential proved short-lived, and now here we sit, no safer and arguably at a greater risk of nuclear war than in 1983. Looking back, that lost potential for a world that could have been elicits a bitterness, part anger and part despondency that casts a grave and sorrowful shadow over this institution. Now, I'm curious as to, to why you ended at that piece there by saying uh, a shadow over the institution, uh, as opposed to either the United States or, or the Soviet Union slash Russia, as it turned out later. Right. So when I introduced myself, I, I said that I spoke. I was trying. I was there hoping to speak on behalf of those whose voices were not typically represented at the Security Council. So 
as well as identifying myself as a combat veteran, someone who knew the realities of war. Uh, so trying to place myself as an outsider, uh, addressing this, uh, this council, uh, hoping to speak for a constituency that's not often heard from. Uh, and so in terms of my first comments there, uh, it's, uh, describing the United Nations in that way and its failure over the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War to give us a world order that was not more dangerous than the world order we had during the Cold War, I thought was something I had to address immediately up front. So basically let the United Nations know um, that what they have done over the last decades has been failure, that they're not living up to their uh, their commitments, their obligations, uh, their founding principles, uh, you know, the obligations that they have as representatives of the various nations of the world, uh, they have failed at those. Uh, so that was my intent in, 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 in trying to lay that at their at their feet right away is that, look, Whatever else I say, this institution has failed because look at the world we are in now. We are more in a more dangerous yeah. place in terms of nuclear war than we were during the Cold War, with maybe the exception of the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, which, which is frightening. And the, right. we could all too easily get into another situation like that 1962. And do we have the diplomatic heft on both sides of that to be able to navigate that, which right. you actually identified and discussed in this next clip? This is an escalatory game for fools and madmen. We are lucky we have made it this far. The arguments for continuing this war reside in the domain of those whom the American political scientist C. Wright Mills labeled crackpot realists in the first decade of the Cold War. Yet those crackpot realists had the good sense not to engage in a war like Ukraine. And both sides had leaders like Jack Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, and Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev men who had the courage and integrity to negotiate. I do not condone or support Russia's evasion. Although provoked, it is a preemptive war that violates international law and is a strategic error. However, it must be noted that Russia attempted negotiations in 2021, 2022, and 2023, efforts that may have prevented, concluded, or frozen this war if those diplomatic offers have been responded to in kind. And that's one of the things that's, that I find so discouraging and disheartening because uh, right before this this uh, terrorist attack happened in Moscow a few days back on the 22nd of March, there was a lot of reporting that there was an attempt at an Istanbul 2 conference where there mm -hmm. behind the scenes had been lots of negotiations again, finally, between Russia and Ukraine. And that seems to now, according to the, the Russian sources I, I follow, apparently that's been now trashed and no one's even talking about that. So we may have added that another one to the past tense opportunities we had to reach peace. And now God only knows what's going to happen. The emotions are so high. I really worry about how this is going to play out now. Right. And this, uh, you know, I mean, this idea of Russia attempting to negotiate is it's been clearly reported by Reuters, by the Wall Street Journal just even in the last few weeks, let alone going back a couple of years. I mean, so this idea that somehow they have not wanted to negotiate, uh, the only people who are holding on to that are people who just want to deny the reality, who want to lie and gaslight and obfuscate about this war. Uh, but at the same time, too, Russia has been, as I said, engaged in this escalatory game. Um, yeah. You know, so both, you, both the United States and NATO and Russia are part of that gang of fools and madmen. I was describing. And um, I mean, you could have your sympathies either way, but I think you need to take a step back and try and be detached and objective and understand that both sides have a doctrinal willingness to utilize nuclear weapons. And at what point do you reach that usage? Right? I mean, this is something where the United Nations, of course, this is the whole purpose. This was, I mean, the idea of coming out of the Second World War into the atomic age, uh, the idea of uh, the United Nations as an institution to prevent uh, such slaughter and such destruction again through international institutions uh, under the guidance of international law uh, is something that has just been completely 
uh, you know, in, in these last years that I'm speaking of has been something that has been completely anemic and completely uh, uh, unable to, to render any to, to, to take any role. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what we're up against here, this escalatory danger, this risk is, uh, uh, you know, not something that we can't over exaggerate. I mean, this is yeah. something. And, you know, yeah. back even before you, you'd mentioned, you know, the, the pairs of, of Kennedy and Khrushchev, of, of Reagan mm -hmm. and Gorbachev, et cetera. Even back further than that, the Eisenhower, one of the reasons that Eisenhower did not get involved in the 1956 uh, Soviet invasion of, of Hungary is specifically because it was the, the the nuclear cloud over Hiroshima was still fresh on his mind right. and he knew what would happen. Right. So he said, we're not going to risk another nuclear escalation over this as much as he didn't like it. So he did not get involved in that because he didn't want to even come close to risking a nuclear escalation. Now they were so far away from that, so far away from 1962, maybe even so far away from Gorbachev and Reagan that we've forgotten that that actually still is a, a, a horrific uh, risk. And, and I saw it's one of many times, uh, about two weeks ago, um, when, when one of the possibilities, when it was being talked about that, that, uh, Putin had said, I think it was on February 29th that I'm, I'm, you know, I would consider using weapons if you, if France sends troops into NATO, uh, NATO troops into Ukraine and fights against us, we would definitely consider going nuclear if it goes into that area there. Uh, and one of the commentator from DW asked, our good pal, uh, General Ben Hodges, you know, is that real? Is it real serious? And he says, no, nah, the chances are zero. The chances are zero that they would do that. They would never, and they filled in the blank. And and I'm like, what in God's name is wrong with you? Right. That zero? That you think it's not possible at all? So just don't worry about it. Ergo, keep doing whatever you want to do, and there'll never be a consequence. That's, I'm, I think, the crackpots you're talking about. Th that's exactly right. I'm trying to understand. It is the, the, the crackpot realism. Uh, that that Mills spoke that C. Wright Mills spoke about uh, the uh, I'm trying to understand that mindset, that psychology that goes beyond that, other than just the narcissistic, psychopathic uh, behavior of our politicians and those who want to rise to the top of their institutions, like the generals, like Hodges, uh, their willingness to deny reality, the willingness to close their, you know, just like a child, cover their ears and, and you know, I can't hear you. Um, you know, this, this, I think a lot of it in terms of people in the United States government and, and NATO governments, uh, well, that's above my pay grade. I'm just going to go with what I've been told and what the, you know, and so that's why there's not the dissension that we need within these governments to stop this. Uh, what you have is you have the people at the very top who view the political benefits as much greater than any potential risks of confrontation. So for, uh, say, the Biden administration, the calculation has been made uh, over and over again for years now uh, that the political benefit of pursuing this war against Russia, this proxy war of damning generations of Ukraine to destruction and suffering and death, uh, that the political calculation is better for the White House and the United, you know, and then vis-a-vis -vis the, the United States to engage in this proxy war. That's a calculation that Barack Obama did not make, right? If we go back a decade, this, this is what Barack Obama's calculation is, is that it is not worth it for the United States to confront Russia this way. And uh, Barack Obama said Russia will always have, I think his words were the escalatory advantage here. They will always have a reason to escalate that is greater than us. You know, the greater than our reason, especially it's on their border, of course it's on their border. Too. They have real re they have real national security interests here, as well as historical reasons that, you know, uh, most Americans could, uh, hey, you know, I, I don't want to go down that path of what we as people know uh, and don't. Right, know. right, right. But, yeah, but you know, I mean, slope. <laughs> but that type of idea. But the calculation has been made now and has been made uh, in this presidency uh, that the political benefit to pursue this war this proxy war, uh, you know, and damn the Ukrainians, uh, whatever consequences they must endure is better than is, 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 is better, is more, uh, yeah. important than the risks that could come from escalation. Yeah. The war. And, and the and way I'm, they write that off, Danny, is by saying, 
by assuring us that the, oh they're bluffing they're bluffing and you look back and you say hey did the russians did, did the russians bluff about georgia did they bluff about chechnya did they right. bluff about syria crimea. did they, I mean, did they crimea, right did they bluff about ukraine I mean, like, and, uh, you know, yes. so, and we know, and, and so actually organization, I'm a part of veterans intelligence, veteran intelligence professional for sanities or, or VIPs. We just put out a memorandum yesterday uh, to the president urging him uh, to understand the very real dangers of nuclear confrontation of nuclear war. Yeah. Uh, Consortium News ran that. I recommend people go read it. It is frightening. When we cool. had the conversations about this last week as members of VIPs, the way that this could proceed from, as people recall, I'm sure you all talked about it, Danny, France is talking about sending yeah. 20,000 troops into Ukraine. The idea would be that there'd be a 60,000 strong, 60,000 man strong NATO arming Ukraine that French France could command. The Baltics are jumping up and down saying, hey, we'll join in. And so we took that as VIPs and said, where would this, how would this proceed? Understanding what Russia's doctrine is. And understanding how right. one thing occurs, another thing occurs, and then Russia comes to the point in their doctrine where they are required to utilize nuclear weapons, and they will do so. We've had people talk to the Russians, and the Russians have said, yes, we will do so. This is right. nothing that we should be we should be dismissing or, 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 or fooling around with, but here could, we are. Could, couldn't be any more strongly in agreement with that, uh, and we're going to continue to highlight that here. Uh, I want to quickly shift, though, uh, <laughs> hard to shift off of that, but uh, it's on a slightly smaller issue, because that's literally a global one, but no st too small is that we're going to shift over to the, well, the last thing you spoke about there was the Israeli-Hamas-U.S. issue there. Uh, and now we're talking about 2 million people, which is not insignificant, maybe not be global, but is a massive problem on the ground there with significant ramifications for regional mm -hmm. peace and security, which we're going to get into here in a second, because as bad as the U.S. government has been on those issues you just mentioned, in some ways, it's actually worse here. First of all, let's take a look at how you ended your speech on the United Nations Security Council floor. Finally, I wish to make a plea to abolish the UN Security Council veto. Whatever justifications the veto may have had, specious and self-serving as they often were, the ongoing genocide in Gaza has forever nullified such arguments. Claims made at this table that to protect civilian lives, ceasefire resolutions must be vetoed, or as Orwellian as the assertions made in Washington, D.C. and Tel Aviv that genocide is self-defense. As the Palestinian people are being defiled and destroyed, for five months the U.S. has defied the world, providing diplomatic cover and unlimited military assistance to Israel as it carries out its unholy genocide in Palestine. In order for this institution to honor its founding commitments and principles, the permanent member veto must be abolished. Never again should a nation be able to protect occupation, oppression, apartheid, and genocide. Now, that was pretty bold uh, to, to actually go on the floor and, and suggest that they take away their power and get rid of the veto. And I am intellectually in 100 percent agreement with you. I'm sure that on realistic position, you know, that no one's ever going to hand over that uh, power unless right. made to do so. But I love the fact that you put that on the table for people to start going. Yeah, because that as long as you've got that veto power, the United Nations Security Council is literally worthless because Everyone has a self-interest and they'll always exercise it to the exclusion of anything they don't like, which means nothing really is going to happen. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And um, I, I felt that uh, if I was to sit there and, and I was told, you know, you need to only talk about Ukraine. This is a briefing on Ukraine. And, you know, I, I, I you know, there's no way I was going to sit at the United Nations Security Council and not bring up the genocide in Gaza. I have too many Palestinian friends to ever look at myself in the mirror if I had that right I mean to not yeah. so I was going to say it so I, I feel like I kind of rushed through that last section because I was afraid it, I was real, real quick did, did anybody say anything double. to you afterwards yes uh oh. I, I had so when you finish when I finished and so what's who spoke before me was the Under Secretary General for Disarmament from the United Nations and then I spoke and then they went around the room and all 15 member states were able to make a comment on the Ukraine war and um, 
you could tell who was happy with me and who was not happy with me by whether or not they acknowledged me. First of all, they wouldn't even look at me when I was speaking. So as I spoke, I could look around the room and I could see, you know, who was looking at me and, and those who were upset with me didn't even look at me while other nations from the global south, as well as nations like uh, Switzerland, uh, were paying attention to what I was saying. And so when it was over uh, and they began their remarks, they would say, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you to the undersecretary general for her report. Thank you, Mr. Ho, for his comments. Sometimes they would go on in a couple of, you know, add a couple of sentences to that about what I said. Uh, they'd look at me, make eye contact, right? Express their their pleasure uh, with the, um, uh, the sentiments you put. Yeah, yeah. With, but I was gonna say with with the with the Americans, with the French, with the British, uh, with the Japanese. Well, she kind of recognized me, but with the uh, folks from Malta. Uh, Malta was the most aggressive, uh, pro Western pro NATO. Really? Oh, and they wanted to make sure they got the invitation to the, you know, the happy hour that the U S was throwing afterwards. You know what I mean? Like that type, it was so, <laughs> so pathetic, you know, uh, it really oh, was, you see that type of just oh, be, uh, the sick of fat that, you know, the, the desire to be the, the, the I want to be with the big kids, you know, like that type of, so, um, they had, uh, uh you know, they wouldn't acknowledge you. They would just say. Thank you uh, to the Undersecretary General for her report. And then they just move on. They would act as if I didn't even say anything. So and that's that's how it works. That's 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 their diplomatic language or equivalent of giving yeah. me a finger. Uh, you know, but it's, it's interesting, though. The Russians did speak to me afterwards. A few others spoke to me after me. So even though I criticized the Russians throughout my speech, uh, they still had the courtesy uh, and they still had the maturity to come up and speak to me afterwards. That's um, but, you know, I mean, the idea of, of getting rid of the Security Council veto, uh, particularly uh, as it's being used in this last uh, year, the last six months, say, uh, you know, that that's imperative because, as you said, Danny, otherwise the institution is is, is, is worthless. It, it well, can't listen, it really I, I can't wanna, do much of anything. I want to move on here because we're running low on time. There's some things I definitely don't want to miss. I want to get your, your thoughts on because, well, let's move now from the UNSC to the United States and especially our State Department and administration. Uh, and let's stick with the same topic there on, uh, on Israel and what the United States is doing, because in my view, there is a very dangerous drift going on right now to where across the board, whether it's militarily, at the administration level, State Department level, we are coming really close to just handing over control to not Israel, not the Jews, to Benjamin Netanyahu personally. And if you think that's an exaggeration, let's check out a couple of things here. First of all, I'm going to show you something that Kirby said uh, yesterday. It was in light of the fact that uh, <clears throat> the U.S. had the temerity to actually not <laughs> veto something that uh, that the Israels wanted this to happen. And, and Net, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was so incensed and so angry that he wanted to punish us by refusing to send a delegation that he had already committed to doing it to to talk about how they can conduct the Rafa operation. Now, we'll talk about this in a second, but it was probably never going to be more than window dressing anyway. But the fact that he felt the confidence to give voice to his anger and then take action against our country uh, by not doing what he said he was going to is alarming. What we did in response to that is even more so. So in, you might think that if you're talking about how they gave you the finger on the UNSC there in different ways here, the fact that basically Netanyahu gave the finger to the United States because we didn't do what he told us to on the UNSC with that vote, uh, you would think that we would say, oh, yeah, oh, hell no. In fact, Mr. Netanyahu, fill in the blank. Instead, it was like, oh, no, we're not upset. Here's Kirby yesterday. Our vote does not, I repeat, does not represent a shift in our policy. We've been very clear, we've been very consistent in our support for a ceasefire as part of a hostage deal. That's how the hostage deal is structured, and the resolution acknowledges the ongoing talks. We wanted to get to a place where we could support this resolution, but because the final text does not have key language that we think is essential, such as condemning Hamas, we couldn't support it. Though, because it does fairly reflect our view that a ceasefire and the release of hostages come together, we abstained. So he's almost like apologizing for not doing that. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, who was in Cairo talking to the Egyptians, uh, said this. 
A major military operation uh, in Rafa uh, would be a mistake, something we don't support. And a major ground operation there would mean more civilian deaths. It would worsen the humanitarian crisis. There is a better way to deal with the threat, the ongoing threat posed by Hamas. Gaza, Gaza cannot be used as a platform for terrorism. There can be no displacement of its population. Uh, there can be no reoccupation by Israel. Uh, and we also agreed that this requires a path to two states with real security guarantees for Israel. And, and, and look, before I get you to comment on that, here on, on the 24th of March, the day before, Netanyahu, previous to that even, and in fact throughout recently, Netanyahu has been absolutely adamant. There is no two-state solution. Uh, hell no, we aren't even going to consider it. And then you still have Blinken saying that we, you can't go into Rafa and there has to be a two-state solution. And then here's what Netanyahu says yesterday, or day before yesterday. <laughs> אמרתי לו גם שאנחנו מכירים בצורך לפנות האוכלוסייה האזרחית מאזורי המלחמה, וכמובן לדאוג גם לצרכים ההומניטריים, אנחנו פועלים לשם כך. אבל גם אמרתי שאין לנו דרך לנצח את החמאס בלי להיכנס לרפיח ולחסל את שארית הגדודים שם. ואמרתי לו שאני מקווה שנעשה את זה בתמיכה של ארצות הברית, אבל אם נצטרך, נעשה זאת לבד. So yeah, he's saying, yeah, whatever y'all say, don't care. We're going to do what we're going to do. Yet, Matt, as you keep saying, I think every time you come on here, have you seen any slowdown in the C-17 military transports to keep landing in Israel by the day, sometimes multiple per day, giving them everything they need to keep bombing the Gaza Strip? You know, the, the Stockholm Institute for Peace and Research, uh, Cipri, uh, who are the foremost authorities on the armed trade, uh, they just published a report that 69% of Israel's weapons come from the United States, 30% come from Germany. So just two countries are providing the arsenal that is allowing Israel to conduct its slaughter. Uh, there's a lot to be not being made about the fact that Netanyahu pulled back this delegation that had come to the United States. Uh, that was the, this delegation was led by Ron Dermer uh, uh, in that this delegation was meant to talk about Rafa uh, and, and come up with a strategy uh, and a lot being made about the fact that you pulled that back. What's not being said so much is that there was another delegation in Washington led by Yoav Gallant, the defense minister. And Gallant is here basically with a shopping list. So I find it very uh, this this really clearly describes what's occurring here. The Israelis, to great celebrity and great attention, pull back this delegation that was supposed to talk about Rafa. But very quietly, the defense minister is still here with his list of weapons and munitions that he wants from the United States, right? And so it is that type of, of all the theater, all the words being said, uh, all the propaganda, it's meaningless. It's meaningless because the reality of the circumstance, the reality of the situation is that the United States is actively supporting Israel, actively enabling, be impossible for Israel to be doing what it is doing without the support of the United States. Israel just does not have the defense industrial capacity to do what it's doing. They don't have the munitions factories. <laughs> they don't have the workforce. You know, I mean, like, so the idea that Israel doesn't need the United States, that they'll do it on their own, particularly when it comes to other aspects, such as what's occurring on the border with Lebanon, is just, you know, it, it, it's just posturing. But it also shows the dominance of Israel, the way that the Israel lobby can uh, has such a, a massive, massive uh, influence on the American electoral system. And that makes the White House terrified. That makes the Democratic Party terrified to the point that you can have uh, the, with the spending bill that was passed by Congress at the end of the week that President Biden signed into office, almost $4 billion going to Israel at that spending bill. Plus that spending bill cuts all Americans assist, assist, assistance to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works yeah. Agency for a year. And every Democratic member of the U.S. Senate voted in support of that bill, with the exception of Michael Bennett, who voted against it, not because of what Israel's doing, not because of the genocide, but because it didn't give enough money to Ukraine. 
Uh, and then Bernie Sanders voted against it. But all the other senior members of the United States, Chuck Schumer, for how everyone went nuts about how oh he's breaking with Netanyahu, uh, Chris Van Hollen, for how everyone went nuts about how he called uh, the Israelis flat out liars and that they were committing war crimes, et cetera, et cetera. They all voted for the spending bill. Context, to actually take action. His words right. meant nothing. And, right. and he, he put his pen on that. Right. Now, this gets a little bit worse in my mind. So there was... <clears throat> we see here that not only are <clears throat> are we basically doing whatever Israel says and we're taking everything that they do and just saying, OK, and we, we tuck our tail and, and do whatever we're told. Uh, yesterday, there was actually a question given to I believe it was Matt Miller. Yeah, Matt Miller was was asked. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That was that was Kirby. We'll get to that in a second. Um Matt Miller at the State Department was talking about a situation to where uh, many had been saying, hey, Given this aid to Israel, because of all these horrific casualties that it's been causing, is violating our own law. We we can't give our weapons and ammunition to somebody who is violating human rights. Well, the State Department, amidst all this other stuff yesterday, some people may have missed this. Answer that question. We have not made an assessment or drawn the conclusion that they are in violation of international humanitarian law when it comes to the provision of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. That said. We do believe there is very much more that they can do to let humanitarian assistance go in. So that's it. There's no that said. It, it is as black and white as it can possibly be to anyone willing to just look at all this graphic video evidence that, that Gary's been throwing up here as we're talking. But look, I, I mean, it, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out that, you know, 30 something, whatever it is today, 35,000. I've, I've lost track of the actual number mm -hmm. of people killed, mostly women and children, 75 to 80,000 wounded. And the number keeps going up every day. And it's going to just spike if if they actually go into Rafa, as Netanyahu is, is emphatically says that he's going to do. Uh, and yet you're continuing to give them the, the rockets and all the bombs and everything else for this. Now, to put the cherry on the bad top here, um, you had somebody at the at this uh, at the White House ask Kirby a question, which I found the question itself to be aggravating because they said, "Hey, some are saying that you guys don't have Israel's back anymore, despite all the things that you just mentioned that we actually have done." There's there's ideas that if you even say anything against Israel, you don't have their back. And watch how uh, Kirby backpedals on this one. Of course, we still have Israel's back. I mean, as you and I are speaking, we are still providing tools and capabilities, weapon systems, so that Israel can defend itself against which we we agree is still a viable threat uh, to Hamas. Again, no change by this non-binding resolution on what Israel can or cannot do in terms of defending itself. So, Matt, you're a combat veteran. You fought in these kinds of environments to where you have built up areas where there are bad guys mixed in with the civilian population. Is it fair to say that that Israel, like their uh, um, their UN ambassador said uh, during one of the hearings this week, uh, that they are doing more than any country ever, any military ever, to protect civilian population. Ergo, the State Department saying, "Yeah, we can certify that they're not doing anything bad." Is there a way to go into Rafa without wiping out everybody? No, I don't think they have any intention of doing that. I, I mean, I don't think there's a way to do it anyway. To do your uh, assault into a built up area nicely. You know, that's just not possible. Um, there, there's, uh, the amount of lying here is just overwhelming. Uh, Francesco Albanese, the, uh, United Nations special rapporteur for Palestine and the occupied territories released her report this morning. Um, very damning. Uh, she cited that a genocide is ongoing, uh, in Gaza. Uh, and one of the things that Albanese says, she says that, the Israelis believe that if they tell a lie long enough, it will become a truth. And that's also what the Americans believe. And so whether it's this, uh, uh, what you talked about with the with, with showing Matt Miller there uh, saying that we have not found that the Israelis are violating international humanitarian law, uh, both in respect to utilizing weapons and, and preventing humanitarian assistance to starving and dying people. Um, you know, that was in response to a national security memorandum issued by the White House uh, a couple of months ago that said any nations receiving uh, U.S. military assistance need to comply with international law. So basically, uh, the Israelis said we are complying and the Americans said, see, they said they're complying. 
and don't believe your lying eyes. Don't believe anything that you're seeing about this, hearing about this from the whole rest of the world. Just believe what we're telling you. Of course, all that is, you know, are, 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 are complete lies. I mean, so the amount of, of just lying that goes on over and over again, you heard it get, again at the end of, of Kirby's uh, comments there, where he talks about the United Nations Security Council resolution that was passed yesterday, demanding a ceasefire. Uh, he calls it a non-binding resolution. So the Americans are just putting forward this lie, absolute lie, that's a non-binding resolution, and they'll stick to it. I mean, we are dealing with psychopaths here. And the, the uh, the consequences to the people, there will be none. But the consequence to us as a people, as a country in the world are massive. And it doesn't just extend into these affairs, you know, it, you know, in, into into military and geopolitical interests. It extends into our commercial, our commercial interests. You want to know why Boeing can't produce planes that aren't going to fall out of the sky? Right. It's because the whole system is corrupt. Because what you need to do to get to the top, whether it's as a CEO or as a member of Congress, is to lie. And or that's a general, what add in, that in there. What's that? We're a general officer. Add that. We're a general there. officer, exactly. So what you we have here is just this continual lying that the brazenness of it, it, it's so shocking. It puts you on your back foot and you don't even know how to respond to it. And that's part of it. That's part of this calculation to lie, is that just it's such an affront that people don't know how to react. Um, so, but what we're seeing is just, this is just um, um, unlike anything we've ever seen in our lifetimes in terms of just the evil that is being promoted here. I mean, there's no other way to describe people like John Kirby or Matt Miller other than evil. When they stand in front of people and they lie so aggressively, so clearly, so brazenly, about the deaths, the slaughter of innocent people when they lie so, like that. So there's no other way to describe here, them other than evil. On, on that that point here, so let's go back real quick to the to this floating pier thing that we're in the process of of sending over there. And I think as you and I talked on a previous episode, uh, look, there are literally thousands of trucks that are just parked waiting to get in to this starving population, and instead of taking the most expensive and long lasting process that we're doing, which will take months to actually before food can actually start getting in from the sea and all that stuff gets built up and all the challenges that's going to be for the United States Navy and all the other pieces that have to come together to make that happen. We could instead demand that Israel open the damn gates today and that food's rolling in there. All those trucks you see on there can just start rolling in and, and providing relief for the population the same day that the order is given instead of waiting a couple of months and wondering how many more thousands, hundreds or thousands may die of starvation in that period of time. Right. It's unknown. But why, Matt, well, I mean, for the moment, take the, the evil, not evil part out of it, just in practical terms, why would the government of the United States basically hand over all the decisions to one man in another country. I mean, is it genuinely as simple as yes, because they're, they're uh, political funder fundraisers or whatever the so-called Israeli lobbies or whatever that the, our politicians are so obsessed with that money alone that they're blind to all the other ramifications, even electoral ones. Yeah, yeah it, it certainly is that that's the preponderance of this. There's certainly other other explanations, other uh, uh, other reasons why, uh, you know, Washington, D.C., the foreign policy establishment of the United States uh, are it, they're committed to Zionism. Um, they have a belief that uh, 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 Israel first policy is in the interest of the United States. You have the role that, say, the weapons. Uh, wait, 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 no, hold on, hold on, hold on. On that point, how is that in the interest of? Of the United States, preference possibly, but how would that be an interest of the United States? Because it's not challenged. This is accepted as fact, and all these things build on each other, right? So if you go back to this idea of how it's an interest of the United States is that Israel is set up in the interests of the British Empire, in the words of the British Governor General Jerusalem in the 1930s, are what we are doing here is creating a loyal Jewish Ulster in the sea of hostile Arabs. Right. So when the United States takes over from the British Empire, it inherits all those interests. And then the inertia just keeps rolling forward. So you hear people talk about this idea that Israel is a, United, is a land based aircraft carrier, which is complete nonsense because the United States has almost no military facilities in Israel and never has. Right. So, I mean, there's the, you can't even point to actual real 
uh, a concrete, tangible uh, interest at play here. Rather, it's the inertia of it. It's just the extension. But then you have as well all the uh, uh, one the the uh, uh, the weapons makers say and the influence they have on American foreign policy. I think everyone clearly understands clearly understands that yeah. you know, that four billion dollars that's just appropriated over the weekend for Israel that will go to American weapons companies. I mean, so you understand that type of the lobbying and the pressure that comes from that. But the preponderance of this, Danny, is the political pressure. Is the is the political pressure put on American politicians? Uh, the uh, use of the Israeli lobby of both a carrot and a stick. Either we will give you a ton of money to help your campaign, or we will give it to someone who will defeat you at the at the polls. As well as the the uh, pressure that's put on the media to adhere to a pro-Israel narrative. I mean, this is extensive, and if and you could see that because if you go and you watch, say, what Code Pink is doing right now, where they've been in Congress for months now, bird dogging members of Congress, asking these men and women why they support Israel. Almost always the answer comes back with APAC talking points. And you can see how the talking points change every week. So this week, the talking points have been from members of Congress uh, over and over again. Hamas is looting the trucks. The people are starving because Hamas is looting yeah. the trucks. I mean, they are saying word for word, that, that verbatim, right, verbatim what we know APAC has been telling these people to say. So, I mean, the 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 the, the connection here. Is is, is 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 crystal clear, uh, you know, and this is not you say it all the time because this this is this is an issue with our system, our our overall political system is completely corrupted, is completely captured. We could have the same conversation about big ag or pharma, yeah, right, right or right. the banks. I mean, this is this is we have a we have a system of legalized bribery or a protection racket, whichever way you want to look at it. And this is the consequence is that when you have uh, a, a nation like Israel with a very effective lobby, but we also have to realize that the Israeli lobby and the um, Israeli government are not one and the same and that they do actually have separate interests from one another. Mm. Um, and this is why there were these rumors last week that when Chuck Schumer said that Netanyahu has to go, the rumors were was that. Uh, the Israel lobby in the U.S. was in agreement with that, that they gave Schumer the OK to say that. And you say, well, why would that be? Well, because APAC uh, the, in the pro American pro Israel lobby, their project, their goal is Israel. And they see Netanyahu as tarnishing that project, as tarnishing that yeah. goal. Right. So you can see how there is that tension or that stress between the two, the two groups, the two institutions, yeah. uh, although they're mostly, you know, aligned. Otherwise, uh, you know, they're right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. But so so let me ask you this. In the last few minutes we have here, is there any possibility that you talk about the, the way the system is set up and the political pressures? All those you just designed uh, talked about right there are obviously the overwhelming ones that that have clearly implicated or uh, impacted on how things work here. But there has been a little bit of a possible silver lining, or maybe the evidence of something that could grow, and that is the the protest votes in Michigan and Minnesota mm -hmm. during the primary that came up. Or so, is there a possibility that the people? despite that, who are not influenced by how much money any anybody has to, to put in behind anything. They don't care about that. They just see what they do see, that they could impose their will enough to actually scare the politicians more that they might not get their votes than that, that they might not get their money over here. Is that even possible? I, I think uh, there certainly are members uh, members of the Democratic Party who are concerned about that. They're concerned that not only will uh, progressive voters uh, not vote for Joe Biden, doesn't mean they're going to vote for Donald Trump, just means they won't vote or they'll vote for a third party candidate uh, like Jill Stein or Cornell West or whoever the libertarians put forward. Uh, certainly not. They're not going to vote for, for Bobby Kennedy because he's worse than Trump and Biden on this, if you can believe that. Hard right. Believe, yeah. But um, the, the, the fear in the Democratic Party is that this is going to affect down ballot races as well. So people don't go out to vote. For the president, that means they're also not voting for governor and lieutenant governor, not voting for members of Congress, not vote for state legislature. So those races may, may be more competitive in certain states, right? So you could see this this uh, this trickle down effect 
on the Democratic Party. And that's really concerning many, many members of the, the Democratic Party uh, throughout the country. Uh, but the calculation that they're still holding on to from the camp, from the Biden campaign, from the DNC, from the White House, is that the loss of three, four, five million progressive votes, however many it might be because of this, is not greater than the loss of support from the Israel lobby. That the amount of money that would be lost, uh, let alone the, that money then being put towards the Trump or Kennedy campaign, uh, as well as the um, uh, effects it would have down ballot, uh, is greater than progressive voters not voting because of this. And I think that's the calculation they're holding to. Uh, I think it's also the calculation that they put into Ukraine, that the Democratic base are still flying their blue and yellow flags that the Ukraine yeah. war gives those who are the most loyal to Joe Biden a reason for their Manichaean good versus evil worldview. And that to abandon that would abandon and strip away from the most loyal of Biden voters uh, this identity. And that's why I think you saw back in September uh, when the Biden campaign kind of officially launched their first campaign video was about Joe Biden going to Ukraine. Yeah. So even though Ukraine right has been a, a right. disaster for a segment of Biden voters, it is their identity. This is good versus evil. And it also ties, it also in the Democratic Party parlance, uh, uh, Ukraine is a struggle about good and evil. Of course, then Putin is evil. And then, of course, they make the connection like they've been making, trying to make for seven, eight years now that, you know, Putin equals Trump or Trump equals Putin, whichever way you want. Yeah, to yeah, have yeah, yeah. Go. I see. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on this uh, again. Congratulations on getting to, to be speaking there before the United Nations Security Council and giving voice to stuff that all of us would love to have said. Uh, God bless you on that. We're, we're grateful and we're going to continue to be unintimidated and uncompromised, just like you were uh, on this channel here. So uh, thanks for coming on today, Matt. We really appreciate all these views. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate it. And we appreciate you guys too. And we could continue to, to ask you to, to, to watch our channel, to share it with other people there so that they have access to this great stuff. And folks, you're not going to want to miss this. Uh, later on this afternoon, we have John Mearsheimer on to give us an update on what's been going on with Mo uh, Moscow terror attack, even some other stuff here with Israel and Gaza. Uh, all the latest he's going to give us today. You're never going to want to miss that. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon. Uh, and then tomorrow, we got another great one for you. Doug McGregor is going to be back, and he's always got something interesting to say. Be sure and tune in for that. And we will see you tomorrow or later this afternoon on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.